Uh, hello, I am Alini Chamis. I am an oncologist, director of the Donco Oncology Group from Brazil. Also, I am a director of the Brazilian Group of Head and Eye Cancer and co-chair of Latin America Cooperative Group, uh, the, the Head and Eye Session. Previously, the standard treatment for patients with recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer was the extreme regimen, which involved chemotherapy combined with cetuximab. In the last two years, immunotherapy was introduced as a treatment option for these patients. For platinum-resistant patients who have not been previously treated with immunotherapy, nivolumab and pembrolizumab may be prescribed. For platinum-sensitive patients, the treatment is tailored between immunotherapy or cetuximab associated with chemotherapy, based on PDL1 positivity. For patients with PDL1 negative, I mean PS less than one, the indication is cetuximab associated with chemotherapy. On the other hand, if PDL1 is positive, CPS more than one, the indication is pembrolizumab either associated with chemotherapy or not. Head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is a complex and heterogeneous disease that requires an individualized approach to treatment based on patient and disease characteristics. When considering treatment option, it's important to take into account patient factors such as age, overall health, medical history, symptoms, and of course, personal preference. At the same time, where we need to evaluate disease characteristics such as platinum sensitivity, PDL1 expression, tumor size, tumor burden and the disease aggressiveness. It's worth noting that HPV status does not affect the choice of treatment. One of the most studied chemotherapy regimens for adenex squamous cell carcinoma in the metastatic setting is continuous oral uracil in combination with platinum. However, Managing continuous chemotherapy can be challenging due to significant side effects, mainly mucosides and neutropenia, including febrile neutropenia. The extreme red regimen, which combines cetuximab with continuous water, uracil, and platinum, can also let, uh, lead to mucosides, diarrhea, neutropenia and skin reactions. These side effects can have a significant impact on a patient quality of life. Therefore, when prescribing this treatment, it's essential to, consi con to consider the patient's performance status and have the support of a multidisciplinary team to manage the side effects. Alternatively, instead of using continuous to oral uracil, Taxan associated with platinum and cetuximab, known as the TPEX regimen, may be a better option. This regimen is better tolerated and can offer a better quality of life for patients with adenectic squamous cell carcinoma in the metastatic setting. Currently approved immunotherapy such as pembrolizumab and nivolumab play a crucial role in improving outcomes for patients with recurrent metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of the neck. And neck. The long-term data for these immunotherapies has revealed sustained and significant improvements in overall survival compared to traditional immunotherapy regimens. For example, after a four-year follow-up, Kinoto 48 has shown a durable survival benefit and longer duration of response with pembrolizumab alone and pembro associated with chemotherapy compared with cetuximab-associated chemotherapy 
In patients with previously untreated recurrent and metastatic adenex common cell carcinoma. It's important to note that PDL1 positivity, many patients with CPS higher than 20, is associated with higher survival. Uh, in fact, almost 30% of patients with CPS higher than 20 submitted to chemotherapy associated with pembrolizumab, pembrolizumab are alive in four years, compared with 6% of patients submitted to extreme leaching regimen. Although the long-term results are promising, the overall response rate is still low. For patients who are submitted to pembrolizumab alone, the overall response rate ranges between 16 to 23 percent, depending on the daily one positivity. However, when pembrolizumab was combined with chemotherapy, this, the response rate increased to 36 to 40, 43 percent, which is similar to the response rate of cetuximab chemo group. It is still unclear why some patients don't benefit, benefit from immunotherapy and treatment options for such patients are limited. PDR1 is currently the only biomarker that is used, that is usable, but is a, it is a heterogeneous and an imprecise biomarker. The decision to prescribe immunotherapy with or without chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone or associated with cetuximab involves careful consideration of various factors, including patient characteristics, tumor biology. The first step in treatment is to determine the pdl one status. If it's positive, then immunotherapy with or without chemo should be considered. If the patient has a high tumor burden, a high tumor volume, they need and needs a quick treatment response, chemo associated with immunotherapy is generally recommended. For PDL1 negative patients, chemo plus cetuximab is typically prescribed. Currently, PDL1 is the only approved biomarker for supporting treatment decision. A higher expression of PDL1 predicts increased efficacy. But it is an impressive and a heterogeneous biomarker. This is because the tumor microenvironment of squamous cell carcinoma of ADNF is complex and consists of many different subsets of immune cells coming from both innate and adaptive systems that interact with the tumor cells or with each other through various networks. Immunotherapy yet has an effective antineoplastic agent by influencing this complex environment. Therefore, PDL1 is a use of the biomarker. However, its predicted value is imperfect. So patients with low PDL1 levels may benefit from immunotherapy, which others, while others with apparently high levels may not. Hello, I'm Maguto Tahara from National Cancer Center, Hospital East Japan. Today, I would like to talk about future treatment direction, immunotherapy-based strategy. As you know, immune checkpoint inhibitors have been approved in the first line and second line setting for recurrent or metastatic head and cell carcinoma, based on the result of the pivotal phase three trial. However, Response to immune checkpoint inhibitor remain limited, and immune checkpoint inhibitor could not improve progression-free survival over control arm. Therefore, there is an unmet medical need for additional efficacious therapy for this patient. Our great interest is now being placed on expanding immunotherapy combination to improve clinical outcome in patients. Numerous immunotherapy-based approach are under investigation. Investigational immune checkpoint inhibitor combination include PD-1, PD-1 inhibitor, 
in combination with chemotherapy or cetuximab. Novel immunotherapeutic strategies include PD-1, PD-1 inhibitor in combination with CTL4 inhibitor, March kinase inhibitor, LAX3 inhibitor by specific antibody and antibody drug conjugate. As you know, the development of antibody drug conjugate and by specific antibody is now in rapid progress. In fact, Antibody drug conjugate and fortumat betotin, plus pembrolizumab, significantly improved progression free survival and overall survival of a chemotherapy in urotelial arteriosclerosis, leading to the rapid expansion of development for other cancers. Pembrolizumab in combination with 5 fub and Brasnam is available in daily clinical practice based on the result of the Keynote 48 study. However, there is a need for new option for patients who are unfit for this chemotherapy combination and hesitate to receive 5 fub cont continuously in future. In a phase 2 study, the Valumab in combination with carboplatin paclitaxel demonstrated promising clinical outcome with favorable toxicity profile as first-line treatment for frail patients who are not amenable to cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Moreover, in a phase 4 keynote B10 study, pembrolizumab plus carboplatin paclitaxel demonstrated comparable anti-tumor activity to pembrolizumab in combination with 5 fu and platinum. Based on these results, combination with carboplatin paclitaxel is considered alternative to 5 fu platinum when combined with immune checkpoint inhibitor. However, this combination is not available in daily clinical practice outside the United States. PD-1, PD-1 inhibitor plus cetuximab were investigated in multiple phase 2 clinical trials. These combination demonstrated promising anti-tumor activity with almost double response compared to immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy. However, no large phase 3 trial of this combination is ongoing. Four randomized clinical trials investigate the efficacy and safety of PD-1, PD-1 inhibitor in combination with CTL4 inhibitor in the first line and second line setting. Neither Dubarumab plus Tolemelilumab nor Nivolumab plus Ipilumab improve response and overall survival. However, the duration of response with Nivolumab plus Ipilumab was much better than the control arm, indicating that the selected patient may benefit from this combination. In a phase 2 study, LAX3 inhibitor plus pembrolizumab demonstrated encouraging anti-tumor activity with objective response rate of 30% in the second line setting. March kinase inhibitor in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitor have been investigated as a first-line and second-line treatment. The result of the LEAP-10 trial featured the Randomized phase 3 trial evaluating pembrolizumab plus lambatinib versus pembrolizumab monotherapy as a first-line treatment were reported at the last astrohetanic symposium. The addition of lambatinib to pembrolizumab significantly improved response and progression-free survival, but not overall survival leading to study discontinuation. Namely, Improvement of both response and progression free survival did not improve overall survival. These results bother us to choose an appropriate surrogate endpoint for overall survival in early clinical trials. Monalizumab is novel immune checkpoint inhibitor targeting natural killer cell population 2A. In a phase 3 interlink 1 study, Adding modalizumab to seduximab did not improve overall survival and progression-free survival 
for patients previously treated with plasma-based chemotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitor. In contrast, in a phase two study, a triplet combination with duvalumab, monalizumab, and cetuximab demonstrated promising clinical outcome with median progression free survival of almost seven months as a first line treatment. Arbocycle is a target therapy known as CDK46 inhibitor. In a phase, uh, randomized phase two study, Adding parbocyclib to seduximab did, did not improve overall survival for patients uh, with plasma resistance, seduximab naive, recurrent, or metastatic hedonyscoma cell carcinoma. In contrast, in a phase one study, a triplet combination with abelumab, parbocyclib, and seduximab demonstrated promising clinical outcome with median progression free survival of beyond six months as a first-line treatment. BCA101 is a bispecific antibody targeting EGFR and TGF beta trap. In a phase one study, BCA101 plus pembrolizumab demonstrated promising anti-tumor activity with an objective response rate of 48% as a first-line treatment. Interestingly, HPV negative patients receive more benefit from this combination, with objective response rate of 65%. Although the number of study population was small, the results encouraged further investigation of immunotherapy with by specific antibody targeting EGFR. Further investigation of immunotherapy based strategy may be warranted. A number of immunotherapy-based regimen have advanced to clinical trial and demonstrated significant therapeutic efficacy and acceptable safety profile in cancer patients. We are expecting that emerging immunotherapy-based regimen will improve clinical outcome in the future. However, not all patients benefit from immunotherapy and hyperprogression may occur. Therefore, Predict biomarker are urgently required beyond pd one CPS and HPV status. Furthermore, novel biomarker provide a new target for cancer therapy. Imagine biomarker have been investigated by oral microbiome, circulating tumor DNA, genetic signature, and immune gene expression profiles. The tumor microenvironment has been investigated using flow cytometry analysis of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from fresh tumor sample and multiplex immunohistochemical staining assay. With the increasing uses of immunotherapy, a more personalized approach using these predict biomarker to choose the most appropriate therapy may be warranted. Hi, my name is Dr. Rani Mara. I'm Director of Head and Neck Medical Oncology at the University of Maryland Marlene and Stuart Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Currently, the standard treatment options for squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck involves surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy, as well as some targeted treatment options. However, many patients still recur and have progressive disease. And so we do need to develop new treatment options for these patients. We know that there are several signaling pathways that are activated in squamous cell head and neck cancer that result in abnormal pro pro proliferation, inhibition of cellular death, and inhibition of local immune response, as well as uh, are relevant in DNA repair and uh, cell cycle signaling. Uh, so investigating these abnormal pathways is really critical to try to lead to new treatment advances. So there are several pathways of interest that we'll focus on today. They include targeting HRAS, uh, which is uh, a pathway that's involved with RAS and downstream MEK signaling in head and neck cancers, targeting EGFR, which there have already been signal several agents in development, and this also leads to downstream activation of RAS, MEK, and STAT3. 
Um, in addition, uh, it, the PIK3CA pathway is increasingly relevant as well as uh, targeting MET. Uh, there are also antibody drug conjugates, which target specific uh, and, uh, receptors and targets of interest in head and neck cancer, including tissue factor, Nectin-4, EGFR, uh, HER2, um, and uh, integrin. So antibody drug conjugates are agents in which uh, antibody of target is joined with a linker to a cytotoxic agent or payload. So there are several that have been in development, uh, which are now part of the evolving treatment paradigm for multiple cancers and are under investigation for recurrent metastatic squamous cell head and neck cancer. Uh, several agents where we do have early uh, phase two data for head and neck cancer include uh, tisotunab vidotin, uh, which has been studied in a phase two trial. And in this trial, patients with recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer who received prior lines of therapy, mainly platinum-based therapy, uh, were, were enrolled. The overall response rate was 40%. Toxicities that were appreciated included asthenia, peripheral neuropathy, and vomiting. Another agent, and fortumab uh, has also been studied in phase two trials. And uh, this also included patients who had received prior platinum-based therapy with overall response rates of 23.9%, median overall survival of 5.9 months. Uh, and again, toxicities that were appreciated included skin reactions and peripheral neuropathy. And finally, MRG003 uh, looked at patients who also had progressed on one line of standard therapy with response rates of 30.6% um, in the EGFR positive cohort of patients and 43% in other patients and median overall survival of 11.3 months. Uh, the toxicities that were noted included uh, constipation, pruritus, and um, anemia. Uh, this agent in particular um, is interesting in that it is composed of a humanized anti-EGFR monoclonal antibody conjugated to MMA3 via a VC linker um, and so has shown some promising activity in the second or third line setting. There are ongoing studies uh, currently with um, other agents, including uh, disitamab and um, CGNB6A. So I think the, the key for all of these agents is that they're all being studied and have been initially studied in very heavily pretreated patients who have limited treatment options and standard options often have very low response rates in this setting. So we are encouraged by response rates of 23 to 40% across the different trials. Um, in addition, there's some early signals of uh, uh, survival benefits. So EGFR is expressed in about 80% of squamous cell head and neck cancers and is closely related to poor prognosis. And EGFR inhibitors have been used for the treatment of this disease and studied for, for uh, over 10 to 15 years. Uh, cetuximab is the only EGFR-targeted therapy that's currently approved in Europe, the USA, and Japan for squamous cell head and neck cancer and has been uh, approved as monotherapy with chemotherapy and with radiation therapy. However, there still are relatively low response rates to EGFR-targeted therapies with monoclonal antibodies and tyrosine kinase inhibitors in head and neck cancer, and many patients do develop acquired resistance. Only 5% of head and neck cancer patients have egfr alterations or mutations. So this is in contrast to what we see sometimes in other diseases. And this likely um, contributes to the limited effectiveness of the oral uh, small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors. One interesting kind of emerging data that I think we're appreciating more is that the there is a difference in expression of EGFR uh, in HPV positive versus HPV negative tumors. Um, and so overexpression of EGFR is seen more frequently in HPV negative tumors compared to HPV positive with 68% um, uh, uh, expression in, in HPV uh, negative versus 31% in HPV positive in one series. And recent studies have shown inferior outcomes in patients with HPV positive squamous cell head and neck cancer who receive cetuximab in combination with radiation or cisplatin. Um, 
So, so this is, I think, a, a story which we're kind of intrigued with and, and is leading to maybe preferential development of some of these agents in HPV negative disease. So agents that have been uh, studied in addition to cetuximab is panituumab. This is a fully humanized monoclonal antibody to EGFR in the phase three spectrum trial. Uh, the combination of panituumab and chemotherapy did not improve median overall survival. However, there was an improvement in median progression-free survival. So the phase two partner trial looked at the combination of panituumab with docetaxel and cisplatin. And there was an, an improvement in median progression-free survival compared to chemotherapy alone. However, this is not an agent that's FDA approved for, for squamous cell head and neck cancer. Uh, for small molecule inhibitors, decomitinib has been studied. And in phase two trials, there was some signs of monotherapy activity. Jafitinib was studied in a phase three trial. Uh, with either jafitinib monotherapy or jafitinib plus docetaxel, but failed to improve efficacy versus methotrexate. And then the phase three Lux head and neck study looked at afatinib monotherapy um, compared to methotrexate. And there was some improvement in PFS. Um, however, it was still fairly modest. So another target is the vascular uh, epithelial growth factor pathway or VEGF. So up to 90% of squamous cell head and neck cancers highly express angiogenesis factors such as VEGF, and the high expression is correlated with more advanced disease, resistance to traditional cytotoxic agents, and poor prognosis. Preclinical and clinical studies have confirmed the efficacy and tolerability of bevacizumab in squamous cell head and neck cancer with promising results in studies combining it with chemotherapy as well as with cetuximab or erlotinib. Um, it's important to be cognizant of patient selection for these trials because of the risk of bleeding with these agents. And oftentimes, this has uh, been uh, a, a matter of eligibility criteria for these trials. Other VEGF inhibitors that have been investigated with less success uh, include serafinib and sunitinib. And so, again, much of the data today is with phase two trials. With bevacizumab, um, this has been combined with pemetrexid in one study with response rates of 30%. Uh, the grade three to five bleeding events was about 15%. Um, the phase three ECOG 1305 study uh, studied patients who were chemotherapy naive in the record metastatic. This was a large study with 400 patients, and patients received either platinum doublet chemotherapy or platinum doublet with bevacizumab. And the median overall survival was 12.6 versus 11 months with a median PFS of 6 versus 4.3 months and response rates of 35 versus 24%. So treatment-related grade 3 to 5 bleeding events was 6.7% uh, in the population who received um, the bevacizumab. And then in phase two trials with bevacizumab and cetuximab, response rates were modest at 16% with a median overall survival of 7.5 months. Um, and similarly, with erlotinib and bevacizumab, the median overall survival was, was seven months. So there still is a lot of investigation going on in this pathway. There's currently an ongoing ECOG trial for patients who progressed on immunotherapy monotherapy, which is also incorporating VEGF targeting agents with, with immunotherapy in the second line setting. So ATRAS mutations are reported in approximately 8% of squamous cell head and neck cancers. This is a minority of our patients, but it highlights the importance of uh, doing genomic somatic profiling on patients with recurrent metastatic disease. A phase two trial of uh, tipifarnib was reported in this patient population. Uh, 50 patients were enrolled. The overall response rate was 30%. The median overall survival was seven months. Uh, grade three toxicities uh, occurred in about 56% of patients and included neutropenia, anemia, leukopenia, and febrile neutropenia. So it did show some anti-tumor activity in a group of patients who had already been treated with immunotherapy. Um, another uh, pathway of interest which is related to this is the PIK3CA. Genetic alterations in PIK3CA are common, about 30% of squamous cell head and neck cancers. And clinical trials have been mainly in the early phase. Um, there were pilot initial studies looking at it, one of the first generation agents, buparlicid with cetuximab or with paclitaxel. And in these early phase experiences, uh, small numbers of patients were treated. 
In particular, with paclitaxel and buparlicep, the response rate was about 39% and median overall survival of 10 months. However, it's important to note that toxicities of targeting this pathway include hyperglycemia, in addition to anemia and neutropenia and fatigue. So there are trials ongoing with newer generation agents. Um, and in particular, um, there's an ongoing uh, trial with apelacib and uh, tibifarnib among patients who uh, have PIK3CA alterations. Um, other agents which have also been studied include opanlicib and PX866. Um, uh, and uh, the phase three buron study looked at buparlicib with paclitaxel compared to paclitaxel alone, and this is currently ongoing as well. Well, hopefully our future paradigm for treatment will include identifying biomarkers, which can help guide treatment um, selection. Uh, currently, we do have the ability to do somatic mutation testing for tumors. And so it's important to identify potential actionable genomic targets to select optimal targeted approaches for these patients. Um, one thing that I think we appreciate is that we may not see as much single oncogene driver mutations, um, which guide the, the pathogenesis of the disease. And so we may need to be able to incorporate combinations of therapies. Um, we also have to manage off target side effects, especially because these patients often are heavily pretreated with, with prior um, surgery, chemotherapy and radiation. And once we find agents which seem to have promising activity, I think it's important to integrate novel approaches even um, into the treatment paradigms of, of even earlier on in the, in the course of, of, of treatment. Uh, so there are numerous targeted therapies on the horizon. Multiple pathways are being studied right now. Again, many of these are still early phase trials. Um, and uh, hopefully as we develop more biomarkers, we'll be able to better select patients who may respond to these agents um, as, as future trials are ongoing.